Speech is in fact a gift of language, and language is not immaterial. It is a subtle body, but a body it is. Words are trapped in all corporeal images that captivate the subject. That is a quote from uh, the Kri, Jacques Lacan, and I wanted to do a, a video just riffing a bit on Lacan, who he is and why it matters. And that was a book or a quote from his uh, book, Ikri. Uh, Ikri means essentially writings. And we're going to be using this, specifically the essay uh, entitled The Function and Field of Speech in Psychoanalysis. And we'll be referencing um, this book as well, which I've done some um, videos and analysis on, Lacanian Psychoanalysis and Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, Christian Anthropology and Dialogue. And then we're going to be referencing a beautiful essay um, by Dr. Klinich from 1988 entitled The Logos in Lacan. So let's see if we can make sense of um, of why this is uh, important, why you should pay attention to it, and why it's captured uh, my attention here. All right, so briefly, Jacques Lacan was a French psychoanalyst. He was extremely popular in the early 20th century. Um, he was born in 1901, died in 1981. Um, and his main contribution was a return and a work working with Freudian concepts, which were being kind of left by the wayside in, in the turn of the century. As the, the, the newly and now emerging uh, science of psychology and psychoanalysis was transitioning from and towards actually um, this Americanized, medicalized, pragmatist, behaviorist, scientistic form of uh, in exploring the psyche, uh, which ultimately culminated in, you know, ego psychology and the development of the uh, DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, I believe it is, which is a com kind of complete dogmatic degradation, uh, according to Lacan. So Lacan fell into conflict with the establishment early on, and it continued throughout his life and through his writings. He discusses this antagonism and this critique that he has for the establishment psychoanalytic um, kind of community. So he's fascinating. He's, you know, he's known to be extremely obscure and, and there's a barrier to entry to his work. But just like a lot of, you know, thinkers and philosophers like Heidegger, who was a big influence on Lacan, there is some, you know, conceptual work you have to do to get into their language but once you do, the concepts are, are pretty straightforward uh, for the most part, but Lacan is notoriously and purposefully, I think, the way that he uses language in this kind of slippery parallax way, it's meant to actually um, you know, affect the subject, the reader, the analyzant in a specific way. Um, so his major concepts, and it's hard to uh, kind of articulate his major concepts in a uh, broad general way category but ultimately the the questions he's and he's applying answers to or the answers he's applying questions to are perennial um, you know who are we what does it mean to be a subject what does it mean to be a person uh, how are we, how do we find ourselves in in this world um, that's colored completely by language and and human civilization is developed uh, through this uh, relationship between uh, the human being, language, and the other. Um, the other is a, is a key term as well. So the important thing about Lacan is his return to Freud and his insistence on the importance of language, speech, uh, the logos in his work. Uh, he was a um, staunch, you know, he was not a religious person. He critiqued religion um, in, in very different ways. You know, he considered it uh, in, the, imagine, in the register of the imaginary, uh, which we'll go over briefly is these three registers, the uh, symbol, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. He placed religion and God even in kind of the imaginary register, uh, which is a, the, the ego is also uh, formed in the imaginary um, register as well. And the manager, imaginary is this uh, space of images that um, are, we are inaugurated in through the process of subjectification, which happens early on in childhood uh, development, um, which maybe we'll get into here. So some more important concepts with regards to Lacan are the mirror stage, uh, alienation, um, the other, the mother, 
the, the name of the Father, of the law, uh, the process of signification, and the fundamentals of the relationship between the signifier and the signified. So he's taking from Saucer uh, in kind of the linguistic turn in the early 20th century, and he's applying it to his understanding of the unconscious, the psyche, the subject, subjectivity, uh, and so forth. Um, and a few other concepts that is our desire. Uh, he's you know pretty well known for his work on desire, uh, and then taken from Freud, uh, the need, needs, demands, and drives. Um, so I, if you're interested in this type of stuff, uh, you know, Lacan is hard to kind of just dive into, but his essay is a rather long essay entitled "The Function and Field of Speech and Language in Psychoanalysis" is uh, a good kind of place to maybe not start, but to uh, situate us in this conversation that I'm trying to articulate here. And I'm sorry, I'm just riffing a bit here. And I'll see if I can come in and out of these texts uh, to see kind of what stood out to me. Um, so Lacan, he, you know, he stood equal to Sartre and uh, he was friends with uh, Marlo Ponty and Levi Strauss. Uh, some of his students were Foucault and Derrida. Um, and he was uh, extremely popular and held seminars uh, in France in kind of the mid 20th century, um, which is known for he's a very contra controversial figure. And a lot of what we see in the kind of postmodern uh, critical theory uh, world is uh, is taken from Lacan. He, you know, a lot of those those authors, those writers engaged with Lacan. Of course, the most famous um, kind of Lacanian uh, explicator is uh, Slavoj Žižek, who takes uh, a reading of Lacan through Hegel in, in his work. Um, question is why is this? Uh, why am I interested in this? And I think there's this convergence or this dialogue with Eastern Orthodox anthropology that is fascinating uh, and thought provoking. So that's why I like kind of exploring um, the intersection of his work with Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, so again, Lacan was highly critical of this American medicalization uh, turn that was happening in psychoanalysis, uh, you know, under the term of ego psychology. So ego psychology is, is uh, a way of framing the subject in the world to fortify the ego, the self, as it's understood in relation to uh, others, to fortify that ego and to make one, um, uh, to make one well adjusted in society and this is what he is critiquing uh, essentially um, so the three registers for Lacan uh, that which is essential again to the human subject is is, is this neg neg negation it's what he is not is what he has has not his lack lack is a, a, a key term that you're probably familiar with um, so he is a human oh in in a sense uh, insofar as he speaks as he speaks his desire for that which he lacks, right? The lack, which Lacan describes clearly is not a material one, but one which, but one central to his spirit, one embodied within the universe of what Lacan calls the symbolic order, uh, the universe of language itself. So the symbolic, symbolic register is kind of the universe of language, which the subject is inaugurated and instantiated in through early childhood development, according to Freud and, and more uh, Lacan here. So again, the symbolic order is the order of the human of the civilized stands with the registers of the imaginary, that which is, but as it is, is ultimately unknowable. Uh, together, they form the, uh, the tripod of the psyche. I'm sorry that I didn't include the real in there. So the symbolic, the imaginary, the real, the real is that which is, but is it, as it is, is ultimately unknowable. So it is what cannot be uh, put into language, that what, what cannot be signified, what, that can, what cannot be put into the uh, milieu of meaning. That is the register of the real. Um, so in his discourse in 1953 uh, at Rome, said that psychoanalytic field is the field of speech and language. Again, we're gonna keep coming back to this idea. Uh, more than for any other psychoanalytic theorist, Lacan's formulation are a theory of a word, the theory of a word. Influenced by the linguistics of Jacobson and Saucer, Lacan makes the human subject a creation of the word. Existence as a subject is suspended and sustained instant by instant, only by discourse itself. A subject is an effect of a signifier of language. 
the subject, the way that human beings understand them uh, themselves to be is completely rooted in language. And it's this relationship between the signifier and the signified that is key here, right? So the signified is that which is being uh, represented or, um, or symbolized by the signifier. And we construct our identity through signifiers. And there's this idea of the master signifier. And the way that this happens is through childhood development, through the mirror stage, um, where the child is, you know, is working with a kind of impulses and drives that you know are fragmented. They're not whole or integral. And there's this moment in early childhood, maybe a, you know a year to two years old, where the baby, the child, sees his reflection in the mirror. And in that reflection, usually the mom or the dad or the caregiver is around, saying, "Look, that's you. Look, that's you." And in this way. Uh, the child um, develops uh, an understanding of himself as a whole image, which he sees in the mirror, but he also feels himself to be a fragmented uh, a being in his self. So this is where this idea of the split subject comes in between the way uh, that I experience my drives, my feelings, my demands versus the way that I appear in, in terms of the image as a whole subject. And that is this and this process is the instantiation of the ego, which is located in the, this imaginary realm. So a quote from the key here, um, Lacan said, speech is in fact a gift of language and language is not immaterial. Like we said earlier, it is a subtle body, but a body it is. Words are trapped in all corporeal images that captivate the subject. The word for Lacan is the scaffolding of a precisely human subjectivity. And at the same time, it is a body, a subtle body, but a material one nonetheless. Uh, so like Freud's concept of the drive, Lacan used the term word, and it stands at the interface of mind and body, spirit and flesh. It is the incarnation itself where thought matter and energy unify to permeate and determine human history. I'm reading a bit from um, this essay titled The Logos in Lacan. Um, the whole history of human thought bears the mark of man struggling to know how he came to be and think and speak. So the concept of the logos is important here. And it's interesting that someone like Lacan would turn towards the, the concept of the logos, which was sort of anathema at that time. Uh, you know, Derrida called Western uh, civilization uh, in terms of foul logocentrism, uh, which heavily critiqued this, um, this idea of the logos. So in it, it is the concept of the logos rooted in Hellenism, Judaism, Christianity, and contemporary philosophy that bears the fruit of this history. The word logos is a multiplicity of meanings, and this is interesting here. Um, a noun, it is derived from the Greek verb levo, lego, like lego, meaning to gather, to count, to enumerate, and to say. So gather, count, enumerate, and say. As a noun, it means collection, counting, reckoning, calculation, narrative, word, speech. The root leg implies gather. So logos doctrines contain speculations about the nature of thought, about the nature of the universe, the rational structure of that universe, and the source of that rational structure. These are philosophies of the knower, the known, and what and how the knower could know. The word logos at once condenses ontology, the study of being, and epistemology, the field of knowing. So logos kind of contains uh, or uh, converges these two fields of human um, thought, right? So ontology and epistemology, making the question of language and language within the social order, man speaking to man inseparably one with the questions of being and knowing. So again, we're moving back to this centrality of the of language and the subject's relationship to himself, to his family, to the other, um, in in terms of its uh, this discourse. So that Lacan would preoccupy himself with logos doctrine seems inevitable. Greatly influenced by the philosopher Martin Heidegger, Lacan translated Heidegger's essay on the logos doctrine of Heraclitus for his students in 1956. References to the logos flavor Lacanian text 
and secondary sources and are as essential to them as garlic and raw egg to a Caesar salad. It's an interesting metaphor there. So this essay, so Lacan opens section two of his essay, A Function and Field of Speech and Language, with a quotation from the Gospel according to St. John. Quote, Then said unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto him, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. So one must wonder whether this difficulty um, that Lacan saw in the Johannian literature, literature was uh, congenial to Lacan. So first, its linguistic vagaries allow the verse to mean other than what it says, giving it the layered signification which is at the heart of psychoanalysis. Secondly, it's more hidden since it expresses Jesus' exasperation with the futility of speaking to those unwilling to hear. Perhaps this verse communicates Lacan's own sentiments subsequent to his forced resignation from the presidency of the Société Psychoanalytique de Paris, an event which had shortly preceded the Rome Discourse, which in fact comprises the text of the Function and Field essay discussed here. Um, later in the same essay, Lacan says, quote, It was certainly the word that was in the beginning, and we live by its creation but it is the action of our spirit that constitutes this creation by constantly renewing it, close quote. So this seems to be, uh, I'm inferring that Lacan was uh, religious, which is not the case, at least on the face of it. I think this is, is something that um, we'll have to explore more. Um, so back to the text, it says, now it would be foolish to infer that Lacan's quotation of the gospel at this point was to proclaim the gospel as such. Lacan would no doubt be horrified at, at that thought. According to Antoine Vergot, quote, Lacan's thought moves within the great tradition of philosophy and is developed on the horizon of theological culture. But he settles accounts with them by a subversion which retains their symbolic structure while reducing their content and intention to a surface mirroring, in a word, to the imaginary, close quote. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, Lacan reg uh, relegates religion in the field of the imaginary. Further referring to Lacan's Seminar 2, where Lacan engages in a polemic with the evangelist John, Vergote claims that, quote, Lacan subversively interprets the Logos at the beginning of the fourth gospel, close quote, by insisting that theology posits language, that theology posits language. What, what in fact Lacan said was, in the beginning there was the signifier, or in the beginning there was language. So Lacan's text posed several interpretive questions. One addresses the meaning of the content of the piece. In this sense, one explores the contextual point to be made, as Vergot does. Another concerns the rhetorical function of location or placement of various textual components or parts. For example, how can one understand the use and position of the Johannian quotations in Lacan's writing? Why does Lacan rely upon a notion of the logos to make his point? Does the use of a term so laden with complexity, history, and unfathomable meaning in fact indicate that Lacan can do nothing more than refer to a mystery to say what he means? Perhaps Ver Vergote's subversion is only an apparent one. Lacan reclaims theology by reopening the question of origins. We can merely restate a glimpse of the truth of the nature of things which he shared with the evangelist, hoping that his readers will see it with him. He cannot describe it. This is an important uh, point that will later be uh, made more relevant when we're talking about uh, the Eastern Orthodox concepts of um, apophatic and cataphatic uh, theology and the distinction between the essence and the energies of God. Um, so he says, we, he cannot describe it. He cannot define it, categorize it, verify it, explain it, elaborate it, or exhaust his possibilities in a traditional scholastic fashion. Perhaps he can only approach this truth in the moment that it is revealed until it passes away. Put another way, Lacan would not have relied upon the word logos if he could have found another word to say what word says. And that word logos, extant and material, stands at the navel of language as in the Freudian navel of a dream, 
that portion of the dream which is in the fulcrum of its mystery and beyond interpretation. Is Lacan subverting theology or stepping unwittingly into a theological tradition which would, along with him, regard all positive assertions about God's nature as imaginary? So again, this idea of God and religion being in the imaginary register is resonant with this idea of the difference between uh, the essence and the energies of God and the apophatic and cataphatic nature of God's being. Back to the text a bit here. Lacan did intend to dislodge the certainty and clarity of Cartesian thought, together with the scholastic theological tradition to which Descartes was heir. His writing and speaking styles were complex, replete with references to literature, art, philosophy, science, and mathematics. Some in frustration believed him to be purposefully obscure. Lacan wished his readers and listeners to experience his text and to be decentered and dislocated by them. Surely this effort was in no way meant to move towards a theology at all. However, it is certainly tempting to look for theology in Lacan's psychoanalytic theories. His, terminer, his terminology, the name of the father, the trinity of the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, the lack, the gap, the want to be, the desire of the other, the drive to death suggests one. Perhaps herein is the symbolic structure that Vergot argues Lacan retains, yet more than simply a structure is represented by the ideas. Lacan embraced a content as well as a structure, and within that content, content lurks a human subject who is radically separated from himself, in a world that he can know only in part, finding his desire for being in his lack, yearning only to be desired by the other, castrated, by, in, castrated in his contingency by death through, with, through which language the Logos speaks its own truth through him, revealing itself at moments of disclosure, only to fade quickly behind a curtain of the unconscious. What better picture of man having committed the ultimate sin of narcissism, of self-assertion, now banished from his Eden, could be found? After the fall, the signifier of the sin became the phallus, to be hidden behind a garment of shame. Perhaps this scenario illuminates Lacan's enigmatic statement, quote, the phallus is the privileged signifier of that mark in which the role of the logos is joined with the advent of desire, close quote. So the phallus is a concept, a kind of complicated concept, um, but it is the, you know, let's say the quilting point or the point of becoming a subject, right? The phallus is, um, is what the mother has and it contains. And in the development of the child, the child realizes that is the child is the sole desire of the mother, right? But in coming of age early on realizes that the mother desires not just the child, but also desires other things, right? So he desires, uh, the mother desires the father. The father contains, uh, uh, is thought to contain the phallus by the child um, and therefore the child takes on these qualities of the phallus of the identity of the father and develops qualities of the father uh, in a society in, in order to become the object of the mother's desire. So I, I know that's a little complicated, uh, but I wanted to talk about this because I think this there's some resonances here with the idea of eating from the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil and being banished from Eden and then con constantly, you know, that's where the inauguration of human desire was at that time at the fall and the constant attempt to fulfill this inherent lack in, in ourselves, we're constantly um, looking after the phallus, right? We're looking after that, that which confers identity to us, that which gives us kind of our ultimate meaning. Um, back to the quote again here. So the phallus is the privileged signifier of the mark in which the role of the logos is joined with the advent of desire. And that quote is again from his book, uh, his work, I think it's from the, uh, the function and field of speech essay as well. Back to the text here with man separated from God, God speaks to him from a distance. His absence engenders desire in man. To quote Lacan quote, through the word, 
already a presence made of absence. Absence gives itself a name. Jacques Lacan rearticulated the, the, the theology of the fall. Jacques Lacan rearticulated the theology of the fall. I've had this intuition uh, for a while now as I've, I've been reading through Lacan. Um, and I'm, it's interesting to see that here. This is again from the 1988 uh, article, The Logos and Lacan. Um, and, and I think it's important to explore this concept without having to feel uh, entrenched. Like we should explore it as, as, as an interesting convergence of these two seemingly separate uh, ways of, of thinking about the world. Um, so I'll continue on a little bit more here. Okay, so we're going to get into uh, a little bit more detail in uh, bringing in some Eastern Orthodox um, writers and thinkers. We're going to bring in Dionysus, the Arepagate. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Lasky, the uh, Russian philosopher, um, and a few others here. Uh, we're going to look through the idea of Alithea, of truth, in terms of Heidegger, and how Lacan took this idea and you know applied it into his psychoanalytic theory. All right, so let's uh, go a little bit longer here. Let me know again what you guys think. If you'd like me to go into a more detailed explication of Lacan's concepts, I think that's something that we can do. But I really just wanted to get this out here, at least, at least uh, initially. So in the text, it says, uh, again, we're still at the fall, right? She says that Jacques Lacan rearticulated the theology of the fall. The version of the theology of the fall of man is one in which we know not much. This is a wonderful uh, kind of passage here that shows the, uh, you know, the mystery that we are involved in in being human. So in the fall, something happened of which we know not much. It created a separation of which we know not much. It resulted in a desire for that of which we know not much. Its effect is death of which we know nothing at all. This might be called an apophatic or a negative theology to be distinguished with cataphatic or positive theology, the theology more typical of Western Christian thought. Perhaps Neoplatonic in origin, this distinction was most fully elaborated by Dionysus the Areopagite in his mystical theology, probably written at the end of the 5th and early 6th century. Whereas positive theology proceeds by affirmations and arrives only at an imperfect knowledge of God, the negative way proceeds only by negations and leads to total ignorance, yet to truth. In the negative way, the quest for truth subverts knowledge, just as in Lacan. So that might not be exactly clear, uh, but this strictly cataphatic or positive theology, which is uh, exemplified in the West, uh, in um, Western uh, Christianity and Protestantism, um, where knowledge of God is conceptually it, it is the conception of God is conceiving and putting language to what God is and um, the uh, Dionysus there Rapigate and later we'll look at Lasky here it's the negative uh, in the negative way the quest for truth subverts knowledge just as in Lacan um, so continuing on the heart of the contrast between these two epistemological approaches to knowledge of being and knowledge of beyond being was steadfastly preserved in the early Christian church. It was, however, all but obliterated by Thomas Aquinas, who in the 13th century sought to synthesize the antinomy that Dionysus described. Aquinas reduced the two ways of theology to one, the united Dionysus intent to describe unknowing as the perfect way, and instead embraced affirmations of knowledge of created beings as inferential sources of knowledge of the creator. Whereas for Dionysus and Lacan, positive affirmations are imaginary. For Aquinas, God is transcendent, but in effect, knowable by analogy. Thomas' Summa Theologica went, bent the twig of difference between the two approaches. This twig grew into the trunk of Western scholasticism and Cartesianism, the very tradition from which Lacan would struggle to emerge. A quote from Lacan. For I can only prove to the other that he exists, not, of course, with proofs of the existence of God, with which, over the centuries, he has been killed off, but by loving him, a solution introduced by the Christian kerygma. 
Indeed, it is too precarious a solution for me even to think of using it as a means of circumventing our problem, namely, what am I? Quote, unquote, I. I am in the place from which a voice is heard, clamoring, quote, the universe is a defect in the purity of non-being. Close quote. So, um, obviously, uh, Lacan was also influenced uh, by Hegel and Heidegger, of course, right? So, um, although Lacan was in part influenced by Hegel's phenomenology of mind, seduced perhaps by the compromise, by the promise, rather, of absolute knowledge at the end of the Hegelian rainbow, Lacan's own epistemology, as reflected above, insists that such a pursuit be discarded in the face of this lack encountered even in the investigation of individual subjectivity. His notion of the split subject, as well as the concept of truth, in fact, find paradigms in the philosophy of Martin Heidegger rather than Hegel. Let's, let's go on a little bit longer exploring this term aletheia, which means truth. Um, and it's a Greek word that means truth. The lithi means hidden, lethi, right, the root of the word. Aletheia means unhidden, right? So the truth is this revealing of that which was once hidden. Um, we'll go on a little bit more detail here. So for Lacan, as well as for Heidegger, truth is aletheia, an unveiling which contains its own veiling, a truth which contains its own untruth. Individual, individual subjects, Dasein, wander in error, in forgetfulness of mystery and in falsity of knowledge. As Lacan said, quote, error is the habitual incarnation of truth. Error is the habitual incarnation of truth. Logos, which is for Heraclitus and Heidegger, quote, being aboriginal truth, ground utterance, close quote, in Heidegger's words, quote, is in itself and at the same time a revealing and a concealing. Unconcealment needs concealment. Lethe, this root of Aletheia, as a reservoir upon which disclosure can, as it were, draw. Close quote. Each word uttered contains its quote unquote not, its negation, behind which Logos retreats. Truth emerges in its negativity from the darkness of Plato's cave. It comes forward out of primordial obscurity. In Heraclitus, Heidegger, and Lacan, the Logos is, quote, likened to a lightning bolt by which beings, the many, the multiplicity, are lit up in their being, close quote. Each of these thinkers is struggling at the very core of human knowledge, groping for a mystery present but elusive, one which disappears beyond reach just as they extend their hands. As Lacan said, quote, what I seek in speech is the response of the other. What constitutes me as the subject is my question. Important quote. I think that gets to the heart of the matter here again. This is again from Ikrit. Quote, what I seek in speech is the response of the other. What constitutes me as the subject is my question. In other words, what constitutes a subject is his ignorance, but an ignorance which poses a question and is quickened by its desire for a response. Surely if Heraclitus, Heidegger, and Lacan were to have posited something like a god, a, a god who slips behind the veil of being, involved with man in a process of movement, disclosure, and retreat, the three would have been writing theology. And this theology would have been that of Dionysus, not Aquinas. It would have been the apophatic theology of the negative way. All right, so I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna go and look at some writings from Saint Basil um, in regards to speech, and we're gonna explore the uh, early lines in Genesis in terms of this uh, this concept, this this conceptual framing that we're trying to work through here. Um, and then maybe we'll get into some more uh, from uh, Lasky and some of the Russian philosophers that are that are brought in here. And we're going to go up to uh, right before we get to jouissance, the concept, uh, the term jouissance, which is uh, conceptually rich uh, for exploration. But uh, we'll, we'll get there here. So within traditional theology, God has always been a speaking subject. Therefore, Lacan subverts nothing when he declares that in the beginning there was language. 
St. Basil the Great, writing in the 4th century on the Hexamonion, Hexamonion, emphasized that at the time of creation, the beginning insofar as it marks the beginning of time, God did not merely think his commandments. He spoke them. Let there be light, and there was light. And later, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. On this, St. Basil says, quote, Let us first inquire how God speaks. Is it in our manner? Or is the image of the objects first formed in his intellect, then, after they have been pictured in his mind, does he make them known by selecting from substances the distinguishing marks characteristic of each? Finally, handing over the concepts to the vocal organs for their service, does he manifest his hidden thought by striking the air with the articulate movement of the voice? Surely it is, is, is a fantastic, surely it is fantastic that God needs such a roundabout way for this manifestation of his thoughts. Or is it more in conformity with the true religion to say that the divine will joined with the first impulse of his intelligence as the word of God? The scripture delineates him in detail in order that it may show that God wished creation not only to be accomplished, but also to be brought to this birth through some co-worker. It could have related everything fully as it began, quote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he created light. Next, he created the firmament. But now introducing God as commanding and speaking, it indicates silently to him to whom he gives the command and to whom he speaks not because it begrudges us the knowledge, but that it might inflame us to a desire by the very means by which it suggests some traces and indications of the mystery. This way of speaking has been wisely and skillfully employed so as to rouse our mind in an inquiry of the person to whom these words are directed. Close quote. And elsewhere, St. Basil asks, quote, Who spoke and who made? Do you notice in these words the double person? Close quote. Later he criticizes Philo Judaeus for speaking against the truth when Philo claimed that God was speaking to himself. Basil is arguing to demonstrate scriptural evidence, the co-eternality of the persons of the Trinity, especially in this case for that of the second person, the Word, the Logos, the Son. Furthermore, he makes clear the essential relation of the subject to the signifier. Burgot, thinking that he is articulating Lacan's atheism, actually makes a similar claim. Quote, Everything, this human body, this world, human discourse, is thus the effect of the signifier. Close quote. On this point, St. Basil, Virgot, and Lacan, Lacan would agree. And so would other early Christian writers, such as Justin the Martyr. Writing in the second century, Justin said, quote, God, having taken thought by speech, by logos, made the world. Close quote. All right, bringing in Dionysus here, and there are some Russian last names here that I will butcher, will butcher so uh, please forgive me. Um, the mystical theology which is heir to the theological approach of Dionysus the Oropagate is best preserved in the Eastern Christian Church and has in recent times been rearticulated by pre-revolutionary Russian religious philosophers such as Kamyakov, Kirivsky, Soloviv, and most notably Vladimir Lasky, who died in exile in 1958. Lasky's work helps to demonstrate that Lacan's Heideggerian turn to a logos, to a truth which is revealed in its concealment, located the analyst squarely within the particular, this particular theistic tradition. In his Mystical Theology of the Orthodox Church, Lasky returns to Dionysus and elaborates his thought. God is incomprehensible by nature. The God of the Psalms, quote, who made darkness his secret place, close quote. God is not the one of the Platonists, nor the unity and simplicity of Plotinus. Those categories belong as such to being, to created things. God's incomprehensibility is more radical, more absolute. God is beyond all that exists, and therefore he does not, quote-unquote, exist. God is non-being. To restate Lacan, the universe is, if not a defect, a mark, a trace, in the purity of non-being. 
One ascends to him who is above every possible object of knowledge through unknowing, through negations, drawing near to the unknown in absolute ignorance. Again, to quote Lacan from the Ikri, Truth is nothing other than that which is truth is nothing other than that which knowledge can apprehend as knowledge only by sending its ignorance to work. Again, truth is nothing other than that which knowledge can apprehend as knowledge only by setting its ignorance to work. So God is the object neither of perception nor of knowledge. He is rather the subject of union, a union which leads to deification, to theosis. And this will be uh, become more important when we talk about the term uh, jouissance, which essentially means enjoyment. It's this type of... Uh, um, in it, this enjoyment that includes pl both pleasure and pain, it's formative, it's fundamental. Um, it's thought of as a, it's, it's applied, you know, a lot of times to sexual orgasm. Uh, they call it the little death, right? So there's this important relationship to uh, sexuality uh, and to a subjectivity that we haven't uh, really gotten into here yet, but uh, maybe we will. So the subject, he is the other who is other to the subject and of the subject. He is the Logos who speaks in the subject, of the subject, and by whom the subject speaks at all. In the approach to this unknowable other, the subject grows ceaselessly, reaches beyond itself, and is filled with an infinite and insatiable desire. I love this quote here. So the Logos is the exteriorization of the Father by the Son the dwelling in being of non-being. As Lacan, Lacan might have put it, quote, the fundamental relationship of man to this symbolic order is quite precisely that which founds the symbolic order itself, the relation of non-being to being. The end of the symbolic process is that non-being come to be, and this because it has come into words, close quote. And then we'll end here with a quick introduction of the essence and energies distinction. So now this God, this other, incomprehensible in his essence, though he may be, is present in what the fathers called his divine, quote-unquote, energies. Union with him implies participation in his energies, not his essence. The essence of man does not become one with the essence of God. As St. Gregory Palamas put it, God, quote, and this is probably my favorite quote that I've come across in this uh, research here. So as St. Gregory Palamas put it, God, quote, is present in his energies as in a mirror, remaining invisible in that which he is, in the same way we are able to see our faces, themselves invisible to us, in a glass, so in our reflection. Um, this, this brought up uh, notions from, uh, I think it's Douglas Harding's book that I, I've done a, a couple of conversations and reviews on, I forgot what it's called. Uh, it's about this headlessness existence, how we exist without a head and, and we become aware of ourselves through interactions and encounters with the other. Um, but there's also this connection to this mirror and the mirror stage in terms of gazing on our uh, image that is constitutive of our subjectivity. And I love this bringing in of, um, of God at present in his energies and not his essence in this similar way. So I'll read again. As St. Gregory Palamas put it, God, quote, is present in his energies as in a mirror, remaining invisible in that which he is. In the same way, we are able to see our faces themselves invisible to us in a glass. Close quote. One must recall here the function of the mirror and the mirror stage in the creation of the moi of the human subject in Lacan. And this God who produced something entirely outside of himself, an entirely new subject, is said to desire to be desired. As in Lacan, the desire to be desired is central to the created world. The point of contact between the finite and the infinite are the creative ideas of things, the logi, the words, what Lacan would call the symbolic order. So the key concept that's we just introduced here is, is central to Lacan. And I think there's a lot of correlations here being made um, by Lasky and St. Gregory Palamas um, with the uh, essence and energies distinction. Uh, so it's interesting to apply and, and put these concepts in dialogue. I'm going to read this last 
paragraph one more time and then uh, we'll finish the rest at another time. So he says, and this God who produced something entirely outside of himself, an entirely new subject is said to desire to be desired. So God wants to be known. As in Lacan, the desire to be desired is central to, sub, central to the created world. The point of contact between the finite and the infinite are the creative ideas of things, the logi, the words, what Lacan would call the symbolic order. Actually, you know what, let's finish. There's only two or three pages left. Um, so let's get into uh, jouissance. So again, jouissance uh, can be translated as enjoyment. <clears throat> Hope you can hear me here. All right, and what of the ineffable concept of jouissance in Lacan? Jouissance is that which is beyond the pleasure principle, an enjoyment linked to sexuality but not contained by it, a joy both Lacan and Freud tied to the death drive. Can jouissance too be located within the mystical theological tradition described above? Perhaps so, for vital to the union or deification, the theosis in this system, is a notion of self-abandonment or self-emptying, applicable not just to the path of spiritual ascent, but to sexuality as well. The person or subject expresses himself most truly in a renunciation of the self. Self-assertion leads only to disintegration. In contrast, in the death of the self is life. And the little death of sexuality is jouissance. And the jouissance of sexuality is an icon of the jouissance of deification. Quote unquote self abandonment or self emptying in this context is not to be confused with psychological concepts such as fusion or loss of ego boundaries or the like. The latter imply a blurring of the subject and his grasp of reality. Instead, the abandoned self of theosis empties what Lacan would identify as a narcissistic structure, more fully what he is, what quote-unquote I is. Reality, likewise, is apprehended only more lucidly as though lit by lightning bolt, according to Maximus the Confessor. Pavel Florensky, a priest, a mathematician, and one of the great Russian religious philosophers and theologians of his century, was born in 1882. The year of death has not been fixed with great certainty because he died in exile in Siberia. Some have claimed in 1952, others 1943. He was a central figure to the Russian intelligentsia. He located himself within the tradition of 19th century Slavophile philosophy represented best by thinkers such as Kirvisky, uh, Kamyakov, and Solviev. The epistemology of Florensky and his predecessors allowed for belief as an independent source of knowledge or unknown or, or unknowledge qua truth, a view consistent with that of the patristic mystical theology described earlier. It is of interest that the philosophical elaboration of this understanding of human cognition moved these thinkers into a realm of ideas and into vocabulary which anticipates, or at least resonates with Heideggerian and Lacanian themes. Florensky wrote his landmark work, The Pillar and Ground of Truth in 1914. In this, he elaborated his conception of truth in both its ontological and formal aspects. Using an etymological analysis of the Russian Slavic word for truth, istina, I-S-T-I-N-A, which literally means that which is, Florensky posited truth as an existent and located it, located it in what both he and Lacan would call the real. So there's this movement of, of God in, uh, from the imaginary to the real, uh, which I think there's some resonances here with, with Lacan. Again, remember, there are these three registers that uh, make up the fabric of human existence, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. The real is that which cannot be made symbolically into meaning and cannot be brought into the symbolic order. A lot of times it's what erupts into the symbolic order that causes a lot of uh, angst, suffering, and confusion in, the, in, in terms of subjectivity. Um, so further, he, like Lacan, distinguished the real from the imaginary, which exists, but not truly. Though the real exists truly, access to it is only partial. For both Florensky and Lacan, the mind's comprehension of the real is never total. As a result, the tension which exists 
between the mind and reality yields a dialectic, without which thought is immobilized, restricted to a sum of these of thesis and definitions. One need only consult current psychiatric diagnostic manuals to find such static, empty categories, categorize, epitomized. See DSM uh, 3R, I think it's DSM 5 now, published by the American Psychi Psychiatric Association. Living thought, however, proceeds through a process of greater approximation and differentiation. Quote, it proceeds not in a line, but more in a mesh, as intricate in detail as lace. Close quote. This surely is reminiscent of Lacan's knot, or his necklace of rings of rings. So go ahead and look that up. It's, it's interesting. And, and the um, three registers are exemplified by three interlocking rings in which all three are necessary for uh, subjectivity and, and human civilization to uh, to occur. So Florensky turned to the ancient Greeks to capture this grasp of the epistemological moment of truth. Again, applying his etymological skills, this time to the Greek aletheia, he deciphered the twofold root structure of aletheia. One, lanthenian, means to be hidden or concealed. The other, e lithi, signifies forgetfulness or unconsciousness. So to be hidden or concealed, forgetfulness and unconsciousness. Aletheia means therefore, quote, unconcealedness and unforgottenness, close quote. Memory then becomes a place of truth insofar as it resists forgetfulness and overcomes time. For Florensky, this truth contains the sense of the quote unquote eternal memory of the Christian church. Like Heidegger, Florensky redressed philosophical notions of the principle of identity, and he asserted with Lacan that truth lies in the contradiction and inconsistency. In other words, truth subverts knowledge. Only in the conjoining of this desperate do knowledge of, of the desperate, disparate, do knowledge and truth expand. For Florensky, this idea pertains above all to personal reality, where a misapplication of a quest for identity results in egoism isolation in time and space, and a quote-unquote pure zero of content. Quote, the principle of identity is nothing other than an absolute monarch whose subjects do not protest its aut aut autocracy only because they are bloodless specters lacking any real personal existence and being only rationalistic shadows of persons. The flow of time from the point of view of egoistic identity consists solely of merely contiguous atomic units in no way inter internally linked by one another. On the other hand, if persons, as well as all individual beings, are faithfully viewed as living entities, then their very life makes them phenomena which, at any determinate point in time, are in some way non-identical with themselves, as they necessarily flow from and toward what is other than their momentary selves, close quote. And here it gets extremely interesting. Um, we're going to bring in this trinity of I, he, and thou in the development of the person. Uh, it's a little dense. Um, I'd love to know what you think if you're still with me here about this, this portion here. So clearly, Florensky's, Florensky's argument contains the heart of Lacan's formulation of the mirror stage and his critique of ego psychology as well. For Florensky, the subject of truth is an I in relation to a he through a thou. So again, for, for Florensky, the subject of truth is an I in relation to a he through a thou. The subjective I becomes an objective he only through a thou. The I receives its consistency as a living personal subject through a thou. Similarly, it becomes object, he, only through a thou who exists in dialogue with it. The he is the I revealed. The he is the I revealed. To quote Florensky, quote, truth is the contemplation of itself through another in a third. Truth is the contemplation of itself through another in a third. The subject of truth is a relation of three, close quote. Recall here Lacan's structuring of the subject, the I, the other, and the object. 
Florensky believed that his model of the human subject was grounded in a penetration of the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Lacan would have rejected such a notion. Yet the work of the two men reflect one another's ideas. Florensky's assertion of the split subject, his rejection of the possibility of subjective unity, his placing of the inherence of the human subject in a radical inner subjectivity, antedate and anticipate Lacan. For, for, for Florensky, as for Lacan, the subject is radically constituted by the other. The model of the human subject which Florensky, the Slavophiles, and Lacan embraced has a moral and ethical dimension as well. This is perhaps best articulated by Kirvesky's writing in 1961. In his system, man, quote, can attain the plenitude of the real only if he is faithful to his own inner constitution, which requires collaboration with others in a joint pursuit of truth. Quote, all that is essential in the soul of man grows in him socially. Thus, it is essential that personal convictions do not occur in a hypothetical but in a real encounter with the questions of the surrounding formative ambience. Literally, that which is civilizing what Lacan would call the symbolic, since only from, only from actual relationships with the essential are the thoughts which illuminate the intellect and warm the soul kindled. Close quote. This position contains elements of the Heideggerian sorgier or care for the being of beings. Lego, the root word of logos, means to count, to speak, to gather. And Heidegger asserts that being, quote unquote, appropriates beings unto itself in an act of care. Florensky uses the term adoption to express a similar idea. The Russian root and the German are basically the same. Being gathers itself together. The logos gathers beings unto itself. And this notion of gathering finds very specific expression in the liturgical theology and practice of the Eastern Christian Church. Unlike certain Christian traditions where a mass may be celebrated by a priest alone in the absence of the congregation of the other, the Orthodox Church declares that there can be no liturgy, no liturgia, no work, where one stands alone. For the work of the liturgy is precisely to gather, to gather together into a church, in the words of the late Alexander Schmiemann, quote, the liturgy is the sacrament of the gathering. Christ came to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. And from the very beginning, the Eucharist was a manifestation and realization of the unity of the new people of God, gathered by Christ and in Christ. We need to be more thoroughly aware that we come to the temple not for individual prayer, but to gather ourselves together as the church. And the visible temple itself signifies is but an image of the temple, not made by hands. Therefore, the gathering as the church is in reality the first liturgical act, the foundation of the entire liturgy. Close quote. And to end here, um, now finally, that has been said what has been said about Jacques Lacan? That he was a theologian? No. That he was a Christian? Certainly not. Perhaps that his impassioned involvement with the Logos concept and the mystery of man as a being who speaks led him to, intuition, to an intuition which he shared with a long and vital tradition of theists who elaborated that intuition or revelation into a system of ideas which are remarkably similar in both spirit and theme to Lacan's own. Whether or not he intended it or was aware of it, Lacan's move away from the West took him to the East. And um, that is uh, the end there. So let me know what you guys think. I kept it under an hour. Uh, I'll probably break this up into pieces. Um, I hope it was coherent enough. Again, I read a lot from uh, the Logos and Lacan uh, by Lila uh, Kalinic. She's an MD. I, I believe she's a currently practicing psychoanalyst in New York. Again, she wrote this in 1988, and it's published in St. Vladimir's Theological Quarterly. Um, and remember, I do have some readings and some analysis from this book as well. And a lot of this comes from the essay of the field, the function and field of speech and psychoanalysis, which can be found in the book Ikrit, or it can be found if you Google that, um, you can probably find it without having to purchase it. So. Thank you for listening and um, I will see you next time. God bless.